in everything we want uh, on this day to commit to you to seek your spirit and your presence in our lives starting from Monday and uh, until uh, your second coming but we ask that you'll be with us that you'll dwell with us and that as we go through the different um, theme and different days that we get closer to Jesus and that we see him as the only thing that we need in our lives that's our humble prayer in Jesus name Amen. I want to welcome you to our first session of our Week in Spiritual Emphasis here at Heldeberg College of Higher Education. So that you know what is happening this coming week, we are meeting every Monday, 10 to 11, here in Anderson Hall. And in the evening, 7 to 8, we'll be meeting in the Media Center. 
You see that newly revamped netball court and tennis court? Well, that garage door will be open. It's wide, and everyone is welcome and invited to join us this evening. In the evenings, we are going to be doing more interactive, engaging, um, dynamic group discussions, still having that emphasis on our spirituality. And uh, in the mornings, we'll be hearing from our guest speaker, who I am going to introduce you to in a moment. So you are welcome. Media Center, this evening, every evening this week at 7 o'clock in the mornings, we are here together in Anderson Hall starting at 10 o'clock. Well, in case you missed it, in case you don't know, our theme for this week is satisfied with Jesus. And this is not the start of the Spiritual Emphasis Week. We started yesterday. Some of you may have been sleeping. If you were here on campus, you would have heard the bell being rung three times. I'm not sure why three times. One maybe for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit. Maybe. Maybe one for the business faculty, one for the faculty of social sciences and education, and one for the faculty of theology. I'm not sure, but it was rung three times. And then there was a loud good morning. Did you hear that? Were you the one saying good morning? Well, I want to introduce you to the ones who, who are responsible for that. Uh, this happened yesterday at 7.30. And at this time, I want to invite, Mr. Lawrence, I see you high up there. But I'm going to invite you just to come down. You're going to come down, and I'm going to invite uh, Joy also to come down. They were, they were the witnesses yesterday. And I just want to invite all those... How many? All those who went up the mountain yesterday. We're not only on a walk up to the picnic spot, but we prayed together. We prayed for each other. We prayed for this week of spiritual emphasis. We prayed for our college. We want to invite everyone just to come forward right now. There's nothing you have to do or say. Just come forward. Uh, Joy, you can come forward. Mr. Lawrence, come forward. Those who went on the walk, please just come forward. Come here. I have something for you. Oh, now you're going to come, right? Those who, you see yourself in the picture. Oh, this, one, this, is, this is how we looked at the beginning of our walk. This is um, the next one when we were there, up there. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you. Joy and Mr. Lawrence, please, you're going to have to open it up. We just want to thank you for joining us yesterday. Okay. Can the college say amen? amen. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Wonderful. Mr. Lawrence, here you go. And we just want to, to give them something sweet because uh, there is a song which says sweet hour of prayer i know it wasn't talking about the cadbury's chocolate but once you've received it please sir take your seat and we want to wish you a blessed emphasis week as they are taking their seats i want to introduce to you our speaker our preacher for today, for this morning. Thank you. His name, Mr. Lawrence, please don't eat all of them. <laughs> Our spiritual emphasis uh, speaker is, goes by the name Ayas Kabasa. He is a pastor. He served as a lecturer up until this year. Um, this year, he was still serving as a lecturer in our Adventist college, which is in Angola. He was born, he was raised in Angola. But did you know that from age 9 to 14, he lived on these hallowed grounds? He was a student at the Helderberg Primary School. His father was a student in the business faculty and is currently one of the treasurers um, in one of our Angolan conferences. But Ayas Kabasa grew up here 
on the campus, and this is him returning. And he has a message to us, reminding us and encouraging us with this theme, satisfied with Jesus. And so we thank uh, Pastor Kabasa, Pastor Ayas, for, for coming and joining and leading out in our discussions in the evening and preaching in the morning. Well, we are going to sing our theme song, and that is more about Jesus, more about Jesus. I'm going to invite everyone to stand. We're going to sing the two verses of more about Jesus. So would you stand with me as we sing these two verses?
impossible. And I call this revival and deformation. What we want is revival and reformation. Revival is a spiritual awakening, or in the context of religion, we use it in those terms. It's a spiritual awakening. And reformation has to do with the change of character, change of lifestyle, change of habit. So after revival, we should transition to reformation. There should be a change in our character. There should be a change in the way we conduct ourselves. But often what we have is revival and deformation. We have a revival. We have this sort of an awakening, but there is no change. Sometimes we're just entertained by the Bible. But there's no change. There's no transformation. I don't want that for myself, and I don't want that for you. And so what we hope we will have is revival and reformation. I want to start off with this image over here. I, f I came across this on Facebook. When I first saw it, I don't know who, who, who did it, but when I first saw it, I said to myself, where was the photographer in order to take this picture? Where was he standing or sitting to be able to capture this? And I, I kept wondering, I kept looking at it. The more I looked at it, the closer I got to it, I realized that this is actually a painting. It's a painting. Now, because it's a painting, that implies there's an artist behind it. Someone drew this. Someone painted this. And when you have an artist behind it, you have an intention. They were trying to communicate something. And so now I sat and I said, okay, what is this guy trying to communicate? And as I looked at it, well, if you look at it, the, the dog is leaping over to catch the bird. Now, only two things can happen. He can either catch it or he can, or the dog can miss, right? Now, whether he catches it or misses it, one thing is for certain. What's that? The fall. And one thing is for certain with that fall, it is death. Now, if the dog had been standing over there all along on the cliff, and then he saw the bird pass by, I don't think he would have leaped, because he would have known that there was what? There was no, well, he would fall. And so, I don't think the dog was standing over there, and then saw the bird, and then tried to leap out. He wouldn't have done that because um, it would be too risky. So I think that this did not begin over there. I think the artist is trying to tell us something else. This dog was probably somewhere close to home, uh, maybe lying down, sees a bird pass by, decides I'm going to catch it, and then follows it and pursues it and wanted it so much that it was 100% focused on getting it. And he runs after it, chases it, pursues it, completely focused and dedicated, and gets to a point where it realizes that this thing is about to escape, not knowing where it is anymore. And as a last attempt, leaps out to get it. But whether it catches it or not, that is the that is the end. You know, sometimes we are focused on certain things in life. We desire certain things. And we, we focus energy, we focus time, resources, we invest everything emotionally, everything into certain things that we want desperately. Only to realize that those things kill us at the end. We sacrifice so many things and we pursue them. And you know, one of the things we pursue in life is satisfaction. We all have desires. We were born with certain desires, good ones, and because of sin, some became bad. But we all have desires, desires that we want to, we want to satisfy, thirsts that we want to quench. And one of them, or let me say the most fundamental desires we have or the existential desires, existential longings. Satisfied with Jesus is a wonderful theme. If you have your Bibles, I want you to come with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we find a man who made life easier for us. 
someone who had desires that we have and went out on a pursuit to find um, answers for those desires, to be satisfied. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Let us begin with verse 1. The Bible says, The word of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. This book oftentimes seems like a pessimistic book. It seems like a book that discourages life. It discourages any adventure. It discourages anything that we think is actually fun in this world. I've read it over and over again. And every time you read it, it just helps you number your days. But Solomon begins out by saying, vanity of vanities. How do we know that it was written by Solomon? I'm not going to waste much, much time in it, but he says he was king in Jerusalem. He says he was very wise. He says he was, he was very wealthy. And then we know that he's, he's, he's a poet. We know that this is Solomon. And, but he goes on to say that all is vanity. I'm going to read a couple of the texts, and then we will go into... Um, the text directly connected to what we want. So let me just read verse 8. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Now this phrase, under the sun appears a lot in the book of Solomon. I mean, in the book of Ecclesiastes, a lot. And what Solomon, not only under the sun, but also the phrase under heaven. So Solomon has decided to sit down and he has decided to look for value in the things that human beings do under the sun. He calls it our toil under the sun. To try to see if there is any value in human activity, in human endeavor under the sun. And this phrase, under the sun, is very important. Why? Because Solomon is limiting his scope. We are going to focus under the sun. We are going to focus under the heaven. We are going to exclude the supernatural. We are going to exclude divine intervention. We will limit ourselves to what is under the sun. And actually Solomon is going to do it in a humanistic way. He's looking for value. He's looking for meaning. He's looking for happiness in the toil that we do in our lifestyle here on earth. Verse 12. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I applied my heart. I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom. Now we don't seek wisdom. We don't use wisdom with the heart. With this organ here in the chest. And so when Solomon says I applied my heart. It's the mind. I applied my heart. It's the mind. Solomon is about to use reason. He's going to use reason. And, and to see what we can do or what we do where we can find meaning. But he's going to use reason. And you can sort of call this rationalism. Because he's limiting himself to using his reason to try and find out what is valuable and what is meaningful under the sun. And so he ventures out with wisdom. He, he ventures out with rationalism to try and find out. Actually, the verse goes on. It says the following. Let me repeat it. Verse 13. And I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Verse 14. I have seen everything that is done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. Verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight. And what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, once again, this, this is reasoning, he's thinking, this is rationalism. I said in my heart, I have acquired wisdom, surpassing all who are before me over Jerusalem. Before me and my heart has had great experience of wisdom 
and knowledge. If humanity were to sit down and appoint one person, one person to venture out using reason to try through rationalism to find the meaning of life or how we can be the most happy in life, if there was a human council um, commissioned to do that, there was only one name of a human being that they could come up who would represent humanity and of whom we could trust to embark on this journey, and that would have been Solomon. We don't have time to go to the book of Kings, but God gave him wisdom. And the Bible says that his wisdom uh, could not be numbered. It was like the sand of the seashore. It couldn't be counted. Solomon, besides wisdom, intellectually, he was doing pretty well. Besides wisdom, Solomon was very rich. Solomon was very influential. So Solomon had the resources to embark on such a journey. He had the intellect to embark on such a journey. And he also had the influence to make it possible. So Solomon ventures out on this journey. And at the end of it, Solomon says, it is all vanity. There's nothing there. Through rationalism alone, there is nothing there. And, and he, he has excluded God out of this pursuit. God is not involved in this pursuit yet. And as he went and he tried, Solomon comes to the conclusion that this is vanity and that he hasn't found anything. Verse 17, he goes on to say, And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but a striving after the wind. Solomon says, let me try madness. Let me see if in madness and in folly, maybe there I will find something. Maybe there's something worth finding in, in just giving myself completely to madness and folly. Maybe I'll find something. So Solomon does that too. He comes back and he says, this too is a striving after the wind. This is where the book begins to get discouraging for many people. Where it seems that probably there's nothing that we can do where we can find um, anything valuable or anything that can satisfy us. You see, we have a longing, which is a longing for God. And oftentimes we try to satisfy that desire for something else. And humanity in general has been searching for that one thing. When you go to the 17th, 16th century where rationalism was having a huge impact, that rationalism that arose, that oftentimes is most, mostly represented through René Descartes, I think therefore I am, there were others. But that rationalism was a rationalism uh, which was a fruit of excluding God from the picture. Um, there, was a, there was a time in history where God was being excluded and humanity was saying, let us find meaning for ourselves. Let us exclude God out of the picture. And they ventured into that and nothing was found that could satisfy man essentially. And so after those centuries, the search continued and continued. This book mentions vanity 39 times. And because it's repeated so much, we actually think that the focus of the book is just to tell us about vanity. That everything is vanity. And that's it. Under the sun appears 29 times. And then God 40 times. Chapter 1, he mentions God once. In the verse where he says that it is an unhappy business that God has given to humanity. That's the only time he mentions God. And when he mentions God, it almost seems as though God has created us to live in this unhappy context. In this context where we long for something, we search for it, and we don't find it because everything is vanity. And so probably it seems that even the search is vanity. But the book speaks more of God than it speaks of vanity. And that's something we don't usually notice. I have mentioned this text. I apply my heart. I have seen. I have applied my heart. I'm having difficulties reading over there. Um, this is why my dad, he doesn't like PowerPoint presentations when he preaches. 
When it doesn't work, sometimes it can, it can distract you. But that's fine. Come with me to chapter 2. Chapter 2, forget the slides. Chapter 2, verse 1. I said in my heart, Solomon continues, come now, I will test you with pleasure. This, my friends, is, is hedonism. The concept that the purpose of life lies in pleasure. If you want to be happy, look for pleasure. Indulge yourself. And in some way, you can actually include empiricism over here. True knowledge is knowledge based on observation and experiment or experience. Observation and experience. If you cannot observe something, if you cannot experience it, if you cannot um, test it, then it's not true knowledge. And Solomon now leaves rationalism, and probably he mixes the two because it's not really clear when he abandons rationalism or he has been um, using rationalism and empiricism also. But empiricism is the concept that through the senses, what you see, indulge in that. What you hear, the tasting, the smelling, and the touching. So now Solomon says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. Give yourself to pleasure. But behold, this also was vanity. And then he says, what use, oh no, no, he continues on saying, I said to laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom. What Solomon is telling us is this, when he gave himself to what most people would refer as hedonism, this desire, that, this, this belief that you find happiness and meaning in pleasure, he says, when I gave myself to that, I did not abandon my wisdom. And by the way, the wisdom he's using here is the God-given wisdom. He is using that, and now he has ventured into pleasure. He's giving himself to alcohol over here. He says, let me cheer my body. But as I did this, I was guiding myself with wisdom and how to lay hold of folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Solomon at the end makes it, he makes it even worse. Instead of just saying, I gave myself to pleasure, I discovered that there is also no true meaning over there um, or happiness over there. He adds something else. He says, I've done all of this during the few days of life that we have. So he adds something else. He says, by the way, we don't have much time on earth. Life is short. Life can be burdens. And we all have these desires. And Solomon ventures and he says, verse 4, he now ventures into something else. Verse 4, he says, I made great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks. And I planted in them all kinds of fruits. I made myself pools which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves. I had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. Materialism. Materialism. Let me see if by, by riches, by possessions, that will bring me happiness. If that will add meaning and value to my life. And for a moment, you may find a certain meaning to it. Because you got something new, you're excited, maybe something you've always dreamed about. Something you've invested so much into and hoping that that will give you meaning. I remember when I was taking business administration, I looked forward to the graduation. A day before the graduation, I couldn't sleep. I'm like that. When something exciting is about to come, I can't sleep. No matter how tired I am, I keep thinking of how it will be, how it's going to happen. That I, 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 It takes a while for me to fall asleep. The, the day finally came, I, I bought new, everything was new. New shoes, new clothes, everything, just for the graduation. I went up, I got my certificate, I came down, I was still excited for a while, and then I realized this thing, <laughs> this thing I got 
the piece of paper, but it's so what? It's done. And I'll tell you that I was a bit disappointed. I said, okay, I'm done. So is this how it feels? I thought there would be something else. I thought maybe I would find something else. I found nothing. Nothing. And Solomon went on this pursuit. Solomon now buys things. He had the money to do it. He was the wealthiest. Because of his in, in intelligence, Solomon could think of ways to enjoy and to give himself to pleasure that probably no other human being at his time could do. Verse 8 says, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines. Many concubines. He gave himself to sex. And we know how many concubines he had. We know how many wives he had. Solomon went all in. And by the way, God gave him wisdom. God gave him wealth. But when the Bible mentions one of the things that primarily contributed to his fall, it's the one thing that he went to seek for himself, the concubines. And it is true. When God blesses you, it attracts the devil. That is true. It does. But when God gives you something that attracts the devil, God will prepare you to withstand the devil. But Solomon, in his wisdom, he became, he excluded God from the picture. He ventured. And you know, Ellen White adds something that is not in scripture. She says that he became effeminate. In other words, a homosexual. Or he was behaving like a homosexual. I mean, I'm sure there are many things that Solomon did not experience, but if there's someone who went before us, who experienced a lot of things, of whom we can learn something, Solomon is one of them. Someone who had desires that we have, and ventured and tried to satisfy those desires, and came back to the human committee and has presented a report. I'm going to read, I'll finish verse 8. Many concubines, he says, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. All my wisdom remained with me. He keeps emphasizing this. All my wisdom remained with me. You know, it's amazing. The things we are capable of doing, although we know that God is. Although we know what the Bible says, it's amazing what we're capable of doing. Although we know what is right and what is wrong, it's amazing. The person who has ventured in all of this is a person with God-given wisdom and knowledge. And Solomon is actually telling us, when I ventured to rationalism, empiricism, hedonism, I had my wisdom guiding me. I was using my wisdom. And so Solomon, in a way, indirectly, maybe directly in some texts, is also telling us, knowledge is not enough. I mean, it is good to know the Bible, but it is best to apply it. It's best to apply it. Verse 10. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no no pleasure for my heart found pleasure in all my toil and this was my reward for all my toil then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it and behold all was vanity and a striving after the wind and there was nothing to be gained under the sun Verse 12, so I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly, for what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what he has already, what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, and there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool will
walks in darkness, and yet I perceived that the same event happens to all of them. This is another interesting thing. Solomon says, I have been wise, but I have seen people who are very foolish. I've experienced living in light, and I have seen people living in darkness, and I myself have experienced darkness. I've seen the wise, I've seen the foolish, I've seen the rich, I've seen the poor. And Solomon says, you know what? There is an event that happens to all of them. What is that event? Verse 14, the wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. No, let's go to verse 15. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen also to the wise. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart, that is, that is, this also is vanity. What does he mean? Verse 16. For the wise as the fool, there is no enduring remembrance. We all die. We're all going to die. The wise, the foolish, the rich, the poor, we're all going to die. And, and Solomon is saying there are certain events under the sun that happens to all of us. Whether you are religious or not, whether you are righteous or unrighteous, you suffer. You go through challenges, you go through difficulties. Being a pastor or not, you suffer. You face challenges. Sometimes you wonder if God is really listening, if God is really out there, if God really cares. Is he truly interested in me? We all, at a certain point in our lives, raise those questions. And Solomon says there are a lot of things that happen both to the wise and to the foolish. And then Solomon in verse 17 says something very interesting. He says, so I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all this vanity and the striving after the wind. I'm going to read one more phrase that is in the beginning of verse 18. He says, I hated all my toil. Verse 17, he says, I hated life. Verse 18, he says, I hated all my all my toil. You know, the interesting thing is this. Solomon at the end of everything, after indulging in so many things, as he set out to discover what we should do under the sun that, that will make us happy, that, that carries this, this meaning, absolute meaning for us. As Solomon ventured in all of these things, and um, he comes at the end and he says, I hate life, I hate my toil. Why does this happen to Solomon? There's a quotation I would like to read. But you see, when you look for happiness in the wrong places, it leaves you more empty than you ever were. It leaves you more empty than you ever were. Solomon was so focused. He was so dedicated. Perhaps to him, this was the last resort. And when you, when you are in a misguided search, and you find something you did not expect and you had invested everything in it Solomon now says I hate life and I hate my toil and what Solomon has experienced is what happens to us when we pursue anything without God when we exclude God from the picture this is this is the end the end and for me, this, 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 this picture illustrates it. This is how life is when you try to live with God. Now this guy is trying to fill these tires with. This is a truck, by the way. He will spend the rest of his life. He will become red, purple, and green. And this thing will never be filled. There's one more thing I want to read. This is a park in Japan where a lot of people go to commit suicide. It's very famous. You can search it on Google, YouTube. There's even a documentary. A lot of people go and commit suicide. It's a big forest. People go hang themselves, and the government struggles on finding ways to help people cope with 
difficulties and challenges. Japan is a culture of pressure. A lot of social pressure. And, and so people will go to this forest and they try to commit suicide. So what they did is they put this sign over there and they tried, tried to prevent people from actually going in to commit suicide. Anything to wipe my nose. Anything. Um, so, uh, what what is written over there? Thank you very much. Mission accomplished. So, what is written over there is, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do this. Um, there are people who love you. Your relatives love you. Your dad, your mom, they care about you. Your friends, and that's what they wrote over there. And I said, man, at least they're trying. But what if you're going to commit suicide because of your mother? What if you're going to commit suicide because of your father? I know a lot of people who were raped by their father, by their uncle. I know a lot of people who are mistreated by their and the reason why they want to commit suicide has something to do with friends. And, and, and that's the solution. The truth is that there is nothing else but the concept of God. The concept of being created by God. The meaning, the value that God gives to us, which is absolute. Which means that I have value not because of what I have, because of what I do. I don't look for value. I was created with value. And that value cannot be taken away. Doesn't depend on my bank account. Doesn't depend on who I know. Doesn't depend on what I've got, what I, how I dress, what I have. It doesn't depend on that. I was born, I was created with value. I don't have to look for it. I don't have to look for meaning. And Solomon unfortunately left that to go look for it outside of God and didn't find it. And the world is in search for that. And you know, there's something I want to read. It says the following. The world who acts as though there is no God absorbed in selfish pursuit. Solomon said, I built, I searched, I ventured my wisdom absorbed in selfish pursuit will soon experience sudden destruction and shall not escape many continue in the careless gratification of self until they become so disgusted with life that they kill themselves dancing and carousing and drinking and smoking indulging their animal passions they go as an ox to the soil Why do we venture into all of these things? You see, we have this desire to be with God. That sometimes we think pleasures are going to satisfy those desires. Maybe if I just get a bit more knowledge, then that it will satisfy what I'm longing for. Maybe if I just become famous. Maybe if, if I just become famous, then maybe that desire that I have, venturing through rationalism, hedonism, empiricism, all of these other isms, there's someone who says that these isms should be wasms. But after
after venturing into all of these things, after excluding God, divine intervention, after venturing into all of these things, Solomon says, you know what? I found it. Happiness. Eating and drinking because it comes from the hand of God. I said, what, Solomon? Eating and drinking, really? He had tried all of that prior to that, and he said it was what? He said it was vanity. He had given himself to all of these things. But you see, there's a key word over there that he didn't use before. He says it comes from the hand of. That is divine intervention. So what Solomon is telling us, wisdom in itself is not the problem. Pleasure is not a problem. God is the one who introduced pleasure. The word Eden, Eden, where Adam and Eve lived, means pleasure. And Genesis 2, 9, when it mentions that God created trees in the garden, there is a word that is used there. It, 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 hamad, it's translated as pleasure. This is prior to sin. So pleasure is not the result of sin. There's godly pleasure and there are sinful pleasures. But Solomon is telling us pleasure in itself is not bad. bad. Knowledge is not bad. Eating is not bad. Drinking is not bad. There are things you should drink and there are things you cannot drink. Solomon says, what is bad, what is vanity, is all of these things without the hand of God. Without the hand of God, it is vanity. Without the hand of God, it leads to despair. It leads to hating life. It leads to hating your own life, my own life. And so, as an appeal for me and for all of us, is that we seek God's hand in all that we do. The things we desire, the things we existentially long for, can only be satisfied through the hands of God. There is no other way but through the hands of God. I want to end with a prayer. A prayer for anyone who wants to live life with true meaning, true value through the hands of God. If that is your desire, please stand. As we pray. Father, we, we thank you for life. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for having Solomon write this down for us. We do not have to go and open the doors he opened because we see what he went through. Father, thank you for writing down this experience. Help us, O oh Lord, to be satisfied by you. Help us to seek you. Help us to remain in you and help us to be satisfied in you and with you. In Jesus' name we pray.